Okay, this is a, a section talking about intellectual property, which is essentially the government providing protection for intellectual ideas. So, for example, if you write a book, you want to be able to protect what you've written there. You don't want somebody to just be able to, you know, completely steal your entire book and publish it without giving you any credit for it. Um, also, if you design a logo for your business, you don't want another competing business to be able to use that logo. Or if you come up with a saying for your business, like the just do it, you know, you don't want another shoe company to be able to use that to sell its shoes. And then finally, if you actually invent something, um, you know, whether that's a, you know, a record player or a tape player or any other kind of um, piece of equipment or machinery that is unique, you want to be able to protect that intellect that went into doing that and, in essence, keep other people from stealing it. And so the government has various kinds of laws that, broadly speaking, are called intellectual property laws that do this. And we're mostly concerned with copyright, which is going to protect literary property, so things like books, stories, television programs, that sort of thing. Um, so copyright is what we're most interested in, but before we do that, I want to briefly talk about the other two areas of intellectual property law. So our first type of intellectual property is the patent. And patents are issued by the U.S. government. Patents protect three main types of things or ideas. First of all, they uh, can protect machines or processes. So this could be, for example, the original Polaroid camera, which was the first camera that, that took pictures that you could instantly see. Um, that was something that was patented. Um, you know, CD players, VHS players, DVD players, Blu-ray players, um, those are things that can be patented. Um, and it can be not just machines, it can also be processes. So, for example, Dolby uh, is a company that designs, like, sound systems. You know, if you have a home theater system and it's got, like, Dolby digital surround sound, um, that is something that would be protected by a patent uh, held by the Dolby company. It can also pr protect designs, so these are things that are the actual appearance of an item. So for example, Kohler Faucets has patents on a lot of its faucet designs. Um, sneaker companies can um, patent various types of designs of their shoes, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, one that's kind of surprising is artificially produced plants. So this would be, for example, if you have hybrid corn crops where a company has sort of come up with a chemical formulation, a genetic formulation of corn that will grow especially well in northwest Ohio soil, that is something that they could patent. So these are all the types of things that patents can protect. Um, in order to get a patent, you, ap you apply to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And to do that, you have to, you know, name your item. You have to give your name, and you have to give a complete technical description of what this is and what it does. And normally, getting a patent is going to require a patent lawyer because you really, really, really need to explain exactly how this thing works and why it's unique, you know, why there isn't already something else out there. And one of the things that the patent office is going to do then is essentially look through its records to see if somebody has maybe already invented this, and if not, is it actually unique enough for you to get a patent. If you get a patent, it protects you for 17 years. Uh, in the case of a design, it's only 14 years. And once you have a patent on something, you have full control over what the invention is used for. So, for example, you can manufacture it, you can license it to other people if you want to, or you can just choose to not do anything with it if you want to. 
Um, there was always this rumor when I was growing up that some guy had invented this magic carburetor for a car that would allow like any car to get 100 miles to the gallon. But the story was that he got the patent for this and then the car companies and the oil companies paid him off not to produce this. Um, I don't think that story was true. In fact, I'm pretty sure it wasn't true. But it does illustrate this idea that if you do have a patent and, you know, you can actually do nothing with it. Um, I also mentioned this idea of licensing. And so this is what happens in a lot of cases with electronic equipment. So somebody will initially come up with an invention. Um, for example, the Blu-ray player, which I it was actually a joint consortium of companies. But for our purposes, let's say it was Sony that came up with the Blu-ray Blu player. And in fact, rather than just lying and making something up, I'll, I'll give you something that's real, even though it's before your time. Some of you are probably old enough to remember videotape, and probably the videotape that you remember was VHS format. Well, there was actually another format that came out just before VHS that was actually better quality. However, it never caught on. The reason it never caught on, and that other tape format was called Betamax, Betamax was invented by Sony, and VHS was invented by JVC. But what JVC did was they licensed their technology to a bunch of other companies to make VHS players, and Sony only licensed to one other company. So what ended up happening was there were so many different companies that were producing VHS players that VHS just became much more popular than Betamax. Um, and so once again, you can, you know, if you have um, something that you've invented, you can actually license the manufacture of that, um, the manufacturing of that to somebody else. Um, your rights can also be passed on to your heirs. It can be sold to other people. Um, and you might have seen these commercials on TV where they have this invention submission corporation. And I think the way those work, even though I haven't ever officially checked, is that they will apply for your patent for you. And then if you do get a patent, they get a cut on any sort of um, money that you make off of it. Um, so again, the, the process of getting a patent is uh, very technical. Um, but again, if you've actually come up with something that is unique and that is worth protecting, a patent will help you do that. The next kind of intellectual property is a trademark. And a trademark are so-called because they're designed to help you market or identify a particular product. And so a trademark can be a word, a logo, a symbol, um, or even a device that identifies a company product. So for example, some of the words that are trademarked are Popsicle, Q-Tip, Jell-O, Velcro, Toyota Camry, uh, Microsoft Windows, Apple Macintosh. Um, these are all um, words that have been trademarked by their respective companies to market their products. It can also be a logo or a symbol. Like, for example, you see the Ford logo, the Nike swoosh there. Um, it can also be a shape of um, something. For example, the Coke bottle that you see there. That shape of the Coke bottle that is sort of wide at the bottom comes in in the middle and then kind of widens out and then goes to a neck, that shape is trademarked by Coca-Cola. So no other company can actually put their product in a bottle that has that shape. Also, interestingly, uh, Owens Corning, the company that's based in Toledo that makes insulation, um, they actually have uh, a trademark on pink insulation which means they're the only company that can manufacture pink insulation. And all of these things, as I said, are, are essentially used to identify products and differentiate them from uh, the products of others. You know, and again, if you watch a NASCAR race, you just see all the logos and, you know, trademarks and everything that are on the cars, that are on the drivers, and it, it's basically all about marketing. So once again, to get protection for a trademark, you apply to the federal government, the Patent and Trademark Office. You pay a fee, which is normally something a little bit under $300. And then it will provide you 20 years of protection. And that protection can be renewed for 20 years after that. And you can basically keep renewing a trademark as long as it hasn't 
come into what we call common usage. And what that means is that your trademark term hasn't become a generic term. So, um, you know, for example, um, there are all sorts of, of, of words that we use now that used to be trademarked, like the word brazier or bra. That actually used to be a trademarked term. However, the company didn't do enough to protect it and make sure that it didn't just become a generic term, and so they weren't able to renew it. Um, also, aspirin, cornflakes, nylon, zipper, yo-yo, um, these are all things that used to be trademarked and then basically became common usage. And one of the ways that companies will protect their trademark is any time that you see a trademark, you'll see like a little circle of an R inside it or a TM next to the trademark. And what that is an indication of is, look, this is our trademark. It's registered. Um, you can't use it. So now we get to copyright law. And copyright law is designed to um, basically foster creative work of the literary or artistic variety. Um, and all of this comes from in the Constitution, there's a uh, part that gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So this is what's in the Constitution that more or less gives the government the right to um, provide these kinds of protections. And again, when we're talking about copyright law, as we're going to see here, we're, we're talking about intellectual work that's of an artistic, literary, um, you know, those, those types of things, which, uh, as I said, this is the type of intellectual property law that is most germane to journalism and public relations. So the actual sources of copyright law, as it stands today in the United States, are, first of all, the 1976 Copyright Act. And this was sort of the first time that a lot of the copyright law that had been um, being made through common law court decisions actually became codified um, as statutory law. There is also the Berne Convention, which is a treaty that has been signed by a lot of the industrialized countries that uh, recognizes copyright law. In 1998, we got the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which actually applied copyright protection to things like CDs and other sorts of digital media. And then we also got, in 1998, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, or CTEA. And um, this last one is one that we'll actually be talking about uh, a little bit here coming up because there are a lot of people who actually say what this Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act did was actually extended too much protection to copywritten material. But these are sort of our main sources of our copyright law today in the United States. So copyright protects works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. And this means, among other things, that um, you know, fixed in a tangible medium means that it has to be sufficiently permanent to allow somebody to perceive it or reproduce it. As an example of something that wouldn't be protected because it would not be in a tangible medium would be if you just give an off-the-cuff speech or you do an improvised skit and it isn't really written down anywhere and nobody records it. Um, those are types of things that would not be fixed in a tangible medium, and so you would not actually be able to copyright them. So it has to be a work of authorship, and it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. So some of the things that can be protected under copyright, um, this whole list that is given here, um, I will just sort of let you pause this if you want to and sort of take a look at, at all of those things, but this is sort of... Uh, running the gamut of um, creative and literary work. Um, books, magazines, choreographed work, graphic, sculptures, motion pictures, sound recordings, um, even architecture. These are all things that potentially can be protected by copyright. 
Okay, so elaborating on some of these requirements a little bit more and reviewing them, uh, we already talked about how it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. It also has to owe its origin to the author. So that means that the author is actually the person who came up with the ideas and the creativity. There has to be intellectual work involved in creating this thing we're talking about. So for example, it has to be creative and novel, um, which means that it's original, that there is you know, intellectual work that's involved in it. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be good, you know, there's not like somebody who's like going to sit and judge and say, ooh, you know, Ashton Kutcher, you know, everything he does sucks, so you can't, you know, copyright this. You know, it isn't like that. It's more just it doesn't have to be good necessarily, but it does have to be creative and it has to be novel and there has to be intellectual work involved in creating it. Uh, for example, transcriptions are not copyrightable. So when you see those court reporters with their little typing machines and they're basically typing what is said in a courtroom, that's not copyrightable because, again, all that person's doing is sort of just transcribing what people are saying. There's not any intellectual work involved in it. Facts and ideas are not copyrightable. Um, so, for example, like a news event is not copyrightable but your coverage of a news event would be. So for example, if there's somebody getting ready to jump off the big bridge in downtown Toledo and Channel 11 gets there before anybody else, they're not allowed to basically kick everybody out and say, sorry, we're the first ones here, we're copywriting this. You can't copyright uh, a fact or a news story like that. Now, if the guy does jump off the bridge and Channel 11's camera person shoots video of you know the person jumping, well, that video would be copyrightable, but again, that doesn't keep Channel 13 or anybody else from also shooting their own video or the Blade or the BG News from writing a story about it. Slogans and titles are also not copyrightable. However, we know that they can be protected with a trademark. Sporting events are not copyrightable, but once again, coverage of them is. So, for example, a baseball game itself is not copyrightable, but if a television network does coverage of the game, that coverage can be copyrightable. Compilations are generally not copyrightable unless there's creativity involved. As an example, several years ago, this came up with regard to a phone book, the white pages in a phone book that basically lists people's phone numbers. There was a city where the one company had been doing a phone book for a long time, and then another company wanted to come out with a competing phone book. The original company took them to court, said they were infringing on their copyright, but the court eventually ruled that that company couldn't copyright their um, phone book because there wasn't actually creativity involved in doing it. It was basically just a list of you know, people who had phones that weren't unlisted. Now, as an example of something that could be potentially copyrightable, like let's say I took the Perrysburg phone book, which is where I live, I took the white pages, and let's say I did a bunch of research, and I essentially found out like what everybody, like what each family in that phone book, like what their income is. And then I come up with a phone book where I have the numbers listed according to income. And again, this might be useful to telemarketers or something like that. But in any event, if I came up with something like that, that could be copyrightable uh, because, once again, there would be intellectual effort um, and creativity involved in putting that together. And just to kind of drive that home, here is a little quote that I took from uh, the Toledo Blade that talks about this idea of the phone book being full of facts but doesn't really have a, a single idea in it. And then I have, I've reproduced uh, this chart from the book. And again, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, tell me like how long copyright protects something for. Uh, it can get kind of confusing. But essentially anything that's created now, it's protected for the life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years from first publication or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter. So that's still quite a long time for something to be protected. Um, you can see the bottom line there, pre-1978 works still in their original or renewal term of copyright. 
Um, those are actually protected for uh, 95 years from the date that the copyright was originally secured. And this is one of the things that the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act extended. And the reason they did that was because a lot of Disney's copyrights, for example, stuff involving Mickey Mouse, um, was about to become part of the public dona domain. And that's when we say public domain, that means something is no longer protected by copyright. It's, it means it's in the public domain. Anybody that wants to can um, use it. And Disney put a lot of pressure on Congress and actually got this extension for Mickey Mouse, which, again, is ironic. And I actually do have a link that talks about this um, in the module. But it is kind of ironic because Walt Disney actually originally stole the idea from Mickey Mouse from somebody else. Um, but again, th these are the, the how long copyright protects um, copywritten works. And then rights of the copyright holder, things that a copyright holder can do. Um, first of all, I want to talk about if you do a work for hire, so, for example, you're working for a company and you write something while you're working for them, for them, they're normally going to be the ones that own that. Um, but so just sort of keep that in mind. But if, uh, you know, the copyright holder can reproduce in any form for any reason once they have copywritten something, they can choose not to reproduce it if they want to. Um, they can create derivative works. So, for example, if you come up with a series of characters or a story and you want to do more books about that, you know, for example, like Harry Potter, um, you can basically sort of keep doing derivative works. Um, you can even do, you know, take a book and make it into a play. Take a book and make it into a movie. Um, these are all things that are considered derivative works. You can distribute, perform, and display your copywritten work. And anybody else that wants to do so has to get your permission before they can do it. And normally that's going to involve them paying you something. So I mentioned this idea of there are a lot of people who believe copyright law is too protected, or too protective, I should say. And we've got sort of a lot of economic versus cultural tension going on here, um, especially with the Sonny, the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. There was a lot of outcry about that, of essentially how it was more or less allowing companies to have copyright on something forever, which wasn't the idea behind copyright originally. Um, you, know, there, um, you know, I mentioned the Disney idea. Um, the other thing is that so much, so much of our popular culture is actually something that is actually owned and copyrighted by somebody. For example, the song, Happy Birthday, Happy Birthday to You, blah, 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 you know that song? That's actually copyrighted and owned by Time Warner. And one of the reasons why most chain restaurants, like if you go in there to like an Applebee's or something, like on your birthday and... You know, you say, hey, it's mom's birthday. What do we get for that? And they say, well, you get a free cake, and then all the people come and sing a birthday song. They normally don't sing happy birthday to you. They sing, like, some other made-up song that nobody's ever really heard before, like happy, 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 birthday, 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 or something st even stupider. Um, and, again, the reason for that is because, technically speaking, if they perform that song, happy birthday to you, they need to pay Time Warner some money. And so there are you know, lots of critics out there who are basically saying that copyright law actually is providing too much protection to copyright holders and that actually too much of our culture is actually copyrighted. A couple of specific people who are sort of at the front lines of, of this fight against copyright are Kembrew McLeod, who he is a professor somewhere in Iowa, I believe, um, and he has actually uh, copyrighted the term freedom of expression. And so he actually owns the copyright to that term and has sort of set up this website that you can t sort of take a look at. He's also somebody who kind of plays pranks and does other sort of things, um, trying to illustrate, you know, basically how ridiculous some of our intellectual properties are, property rights are. And then the other guy here in the blue shirt is a guy named Larry Lessig. Um, he has been um, one of the foremost opponents of too much copyright protection. 
Uh, he's currently at Harvard University, and I've given you some links to some of his stuff that's uh, pretty interesting. So to get a copyright on something, normally what you do is you send a copy of the work to the Copyright Office, and they will register it. And then you also want to make sure that you indicate on the work that it's copyrighted. And the, the basic format for doing that is the word copyright, and then the little C in the circle, and then the date and the name of the copyright holder. And if you don't have the little C symbol, you can just put a C in between parentheses. And the idea here is that you're telling anybody that might be looking at this, hey, this is copyrighted, I own this, you can't just use this. Now, just to mention mu music relatively briefly, because it isn't something that we particularly care about in this class, but sometimes people find it interesting, so I mention it. Music works a little bit differently. Music actually works under something called compulsory licensing. And, and the main difference is that if you write a song and you copyright it, you can't keep other people from performing the song. However, they're going to have to pay you something to perform the song. So, for example, if I write a song and my band performs it, I can't keep Justin Bieber from doing his own version of the song. Um, now, he's going to have to pay me something, but I can't keep him from performing the song. And that's a little bit different from copyright on a book, for example, because if I do copyright a book, I can certainly keep anybody else from printing that book. Um, however, music works a little bit differently. And obviously, there's a, a lot of issues involved here in um, digital music. Um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, as I said, uh, put a lot of stuff in about um, copyright protection for discs. Um, it also provides for stuff like when you buy something from the iTunes store and it's got that digital protection on it. Um, these are all basically things that are designed to keep you from stealing stuff. And then there's actually some interesting stuff about sampling in the book, which is actually becoming more and more a part of popular music. Um, this idea of sampling, you know, other people's songs, like other snippets of songs. Um, and so there are some interesting court cases about that. Um, and sort of some interesting, you know, things that you can look into on your own about that. Okay, and now finally, and, but, you know, finally, but importantly, uh, the concept of fair use. All of the other stuff that I've been talking about, about copyright, is true. It does provide protection. It does allow the copyright holder to keep other people from... Um, printing the copyrighted work or reproducing it. However, fair use is a concept that allows you to take parts of a copyrighted work and use them for certain purposes. So, for example, um, in educational purposes, we are sometimes allowed to take copyrighted work and use them in classes. Uh, if you're doing a review of a book, and you want to use a few passages from the book to sort of illustrate your review, to give an example of how the author talks about, you know, how Harry Potter slew the dragon or whatever. I don't even know what Harry Potter's about, i got to confess. I know it's a dude with glasses and they play Quidditch, but that's all I know. So anyway, I don't know if Harry Potter ever slayed a dragon, but let's say he did. Um, so again, you could use, you know, part of the Harry Potter book in your review um, to sort of illustrate a point. So this concept of fair use, though, uh, depends on four things. And these four things are important, and so I suggest you uh, write them down and read about them and understand them. So first of all is the purpose and character of the use. And one of the big things that the courts are going to look at here is the idea of transformative value. Transformative value means that you've taken the copyrighted work and you've made it into something different. So once again, the idea of you doing a book review of the Harry Potter book. You write a review of the new Harry Potter book for the New York Times. So you're going to use a few passages from the book in your review, but you're not sort of just copying the book or you're not making, you know, the your review a substitute for the book, you're doing something else. You're transforming 
the work into a book review. Um, generally speaking, if it's a non-commercial use, it's going to be considered more favorable than if it's a commercial use. Um, news is considered more favorable than other types of use. And also education is considered more favorable than other kinds of uses. Now, however, that doesn't mean that education just gets a blank ticket and can do whatever they want. It used to be that way. Uh, when I was an undergrad, you know, professors could basically put together a big Kinko's packet of like a thousand pages of, of stuff that they had just copied out of books. And you could go to Kinko's and buy that just for the price of the, you know, blank sheets of paper. They can't do that anymore because essentially Kinko's won't, won't make any kind of course packets like that unless you've paid copyright for them. So we look at the, um, the purpose and character of the use. We also look at the nature of the copyrighted work itself. So a couple of things there. First of all, we ask, is the copyrighted work still available? So if it's a book that's out of print, so the book is no longer available, well, then it might be more likely that it's okay for you to use parts or big chunks of that book because it's really no longer available. Um, also, um, is the work what is called consumable? And this, for example, talks about um, the idea of like a puzzle book. So if I have a Harry Potter book, and I hate to keep using Harry Potter, but I am. Like if I have a Harry Potter book and I buy it and I read it and then I pass it along to you, you know, you can still read it just as well as I did. But if I have a puzzle book where it's like crossword puzzles or Sudoku or whatever, and I do all the puzzles in it and then I pass it on to you, well, that's useless to you because I've done all the puzzles. So what that leads to is if it is a consumable work, um, it is less likely that you making copies of it would be considered um, a fair use. And then also we do have to ask has, if it's something that's about to be published. If it's something that has not yet been published but the copyright owner has a copyright on it, the courts will protect that person's right to be the first to come out with that book or with that information. And this actually became a big case that's talked about in the book where um, Gerald Ford's memoirs were going to come out in a book. Gerald Ford was the president in the 70s. His memoirs were about to come out, and the Nation magazine got access to part of the memoirs and printed them in its magazine before the book came out. The copyright owners of the book sued successfully because, again, what the court said was the copyright owner definitely had the right to be the first to copyright the work. Third thing we look at is the amount of the work used. And what's important here is proportion. It's not necessarily like a word count or anything like that. It's basically a proportion. So the higher the proportion of something that you use, the less likely it is that it's a fair use. So for example, if I take a paragraph out of a 400 page book, that's very likely a fair use. But if I take a paragraph out of a two-paragraph poem, well, then I've taken like half the poem, and it's less likely that's going to be a fair use. So there's an interesting little footnote here, too, when we come into the idea of parody. And I assume that you guys all know who Weird Al Yankovic is. He's the guy that does like the parody songs. Courts do recognize that if you do a parody of something, that you more or less have to steal a lot of the original. So for example, when Weird Al does a parody of a song, his song has to sound pretty much like the other song. Otherwise, it's not funny. So when it does come to a parody, courts do you know, recognize that and recognize that in a parody, you have to um, basically steal a lot of the original work to make that work. And then finally, and this is in a lot of ways the most important one that the court looks at, and this is the effect on the market. So if you're stealing something or using something out of a copyrighted work is going to harm the market for the original, then it's unlikely that it's a fair use. So in other words, you have to say, is somebody going to buy what I've done instead of buying the original? And if the answer to that is yes, 
then it's likely that that is not a fair use. So fair use, uh, summing it up again, is just a concept that allows you to use parts of a copyrighted work. However, we do need to consider these four things um, to decide whether it's actually a fair use or a copyright infringement. So there's copyright and intellectual property for you.